for this opportunity to be with all of you this evening. And I sincerely thank you for taking your very precious time to be with us. The subject I was asked to speak was Vedic solutions to climate change. Recently, well, it was actually a couple years ago, I was in Udupi, a very spiritually holy place in South India. The place I was staying was on a dirt road, which was quite away from the city or the town. And every day I would look outside my window and see a little puppy dog. There were two little puppy dogs. And the mother was always trying to protect them. Because I had heard from people in the house I was staying that two of her other puppies were run over by cars and killed. Right in front of her eyes. And these were her two surviving children. So you can imagine how fearful, how attached, and how protective she was after seeing two of her own children killed by cars. Now one of these little puppy dogs, very small, just like a little ball of fur, was so energetic. He was just running and jumping and leaping. And one day, he decided he wanted to dig a hole that he could lay in. So he was working for hours and hours every day, just digging on the side of the road, digging, digging. And the mother would come up and lick, lick him and smell him and feed him. And he was just very attentive, intense, determined. About three, four days he was digging until the hole was about a foot deep. And when he finally got that hole really nice, he went inside, curled up, and went to sleep. And I, I walked by and I saw, and he was, it was like he was in heaven. It was his own custom-made, personally tailored bed. <laughs> One day it was about seven o'clock in the morning. I was walking, uh, chanting God's names, Japa, along railway, ra railroad tracks. And I was coming back and I turned onto this road and there was a car. The car was going down the road, but somebody parked a motorbike right in the middle of the road. So the car turned off the road, you know, just went to the side, and I saw the front tire sink and I heard, <coughs> And then the back tire, I saw it sink, and there was only silence. It was the dog. Suddenly I heard the most piteous, heart-cracking howl of his mother. I won't try to imitate that howl. 
it was the howl of a totally distressed, broken heart. And I saw her running and running and running. And she came to that hole, and I ran to the hole. And the little puppy, blood was streaming out of its nostrils and out of its mouth. And it was in so much pain, its little legs were, were flapping uncontrollably. And the mother was looking at it, looking at him. And I sat right next to him, and the mother understood that I Dogs are people, too, what to speak of cows. She understood that I cared. So I sat right in front of that little dog and loudly chanted the holy names, because he was going to die. And she, she stepped back and just watched as I was chanting. And the paws were flapping, flapping. Then they both went up and slowly came down, and he was dead. And as soon as he stopped breathing, and it was very, very pronounced that moment, I heard the mother. It was the most eerie, heartbreaking sound you can imagine. She just went, and I looked over and tears were streaming from both sides of her eyes, down her fur. And I st stepped aside and she ran over and she was licking the dead body of her little child, licking and licking and licking frantically, as if she was trying to lick life back into him. But he was gone. And for the next several hours, she just kept lift, licking the little body of her child. And then his little brother came, and he just sat on the side of the hall watching his mother licking, and he started crying and going, mm hmm. That night, this happened in the morning, that night, all night long, I came out to look out the window, and I saw the mother. She would walk a few steps and come back and lick her little baby. She would walk 20 steps and come back. She would walk 30 steps and come back. Finally, I asked a neighbor, because, you know, it wasn't my property. I couldn't do anything. I said, could you bury this little puppy because the mother is, is not going to get over this until it's out of sight. So the neighbor did that. But then I saw the mother and her baby for the next two, three days was just going and crying over that hole and smelling the hole. And people say that, that animals are not people. As Goranga Prabhu explained, I did take care of cows for about eight years. And many times I would assist in the giving birth of a calf. And when that calf would die, how the mother would cry, how the mother would weep. And when the calf was alive, how she licked it and cared for it and gave it milk. These animals may not have the intellectual, philosophical capacity we have, but their will to live and their concern for each other, their feelings, are very similar. A human mother wouldn't suffer too much more than that dog mother at 
seeing the loss of her baby. One of the basic foundational principles of Vedic culture is the respect of life. Paradukaduki, that another person's suffering should be our suffering. Another person's happiness should be our happiness. Vidyavanaya Sampani Brahmani Gabihastini Suni Chaiva Swabhakicha Pandita Samadarshana. What does it mean to be learned according to Bhagavad Gita? Actually being learned from a Vedic perspective means that you see everyone with equal vision. Whether one be a Brahman or whether one be working in the fields. Whether one be an elephant, a cow, or a dog. One sees the soul, the atma, a part of God, wherever there is life. It shouldn't be that we're only compassionate toward those that are relevant to me. In the West, a person's dog is really a part of the family. <laughs> People will walk behind their dog with special plastic gloves, hit up with that hand and a special bag he puts it in. And he's carrying, in one hand, he's carrying a bag with the dog's excrement. And on the other hand, he has his glove, which, and he, he takes it off and puts it in the bag. And then, you know, the dog, the nature of dogs, they like to do things in um, installments. <laughs> I have observed like this. <laughs> so they're very meticulous, very possessive. If you, if, if, if you kick their dog, they'll be outraged. But, if, but then they go home and eat cows and lambs and chickens and don't think twice about it. They feel as much as their dog. They love... They care for their children as much as that dog does. But because it's not relevant to me, it doesn't matter if it suffers. Compassion comes to higher level, to the level it's more and more inclusive of other living beings. Compassion only for those people that are very directly involved with my life because of my attachment for them. It's compassion, but it's, it's a type of selfish compassion. To the degree our compassion is selfless, it's not about me, it's about that person. That's real compassion. The greatest need in the world today Now back to that little puppy. His story is very much the story of humanity. He worked so hard with such determination and attention to dig a hole that he could enjoy. But the very hole became the cause of his suffering and death. You have heard this saying, to dig your own grave. Well, on that particular day, that saying, it echoed within my mind as a brutal reality. Yes, we work very hard, 
the human intelligence is to look into the future and understand deeper and higher principles than just the temporary accomplishments we make and the pleasures that we derive from them. That's intelligence. Mary Shelley wrote a novel called Frankenstein. Have you all heard of that? Frankenstein is a monster. But that's not really the purpose. Dr. Frankenstein, he had very noble and good ideals. He wanted to create an ideal human being that could live extraordinarily long and could help the world. But the problem, he was meddling with the laws of nature. Although his intents may have been good to help, because he wasn't really seeing the whole picture of how the world works. He wasn't really seeing the way God works. In his attempt to make something for the benefit of man, he created a monster that terrorized him and all the people in the area. He dug his own grave. From the Vedic perspective, this is very much what's happening to the world today. Our sciences, our technologies, our industries, even if there's good motivations, unless we understand the laws of nature, the laws of God, and take responsibility for what we're doing, we can create monsters that become totally out of our control. You just saw some nice videos with statistics of what's going on. I was given pages and pages and pages of statistics about what's happening to the water on the global level, what's happening to the earth on the global level, what's happening to the forests, what's happening to the rivers and the air, and the rise in cancer and the rise in heart disease and the rise in depression and stress and mental illness. And they're all interrelated. And what to do? With all the global warming and all the toxic waste, practically 80% of the rivers of India are so toxically polluted. The Yamun and the Ganges, hundreds of times beyond what's safe for a human being to even touch. And that's not being caused by the monkeys or the deers or the cows. Not even the snakes. <laughs> it's caused by us, the humans, who are supposed to be so intelligent. Yes, we make progress. We make facilities to enjoy. But at what cost? And where is it going? 
even the biggest brains in the world, geologists and scientists who are actually concerned, that it's just not from the Vedic perspective. Because today's topic is Vedic solutions to climate change. According to many scientists and geologists, because of all the toxic waste and all of the pollution and all of the greenhouse effect and gases and, and, and synthetic chemicals in the ozone and everywhere else, because the earth is so polluted and because of, from a spiritual perspective, according, the karma is so polluted worldwide, There's going to be reactions. Now the Vedic solution always goes to the essential cause. And what is the essential cause of all, of everything? It is consciousness. If we deal properly with consciousness, then we can substantially, realistically deal with the problems of this world. Otherwise, we're just doing patchwork. There's an infection and we just put some salve and a band-aid on it. And another perfection is salve and a band-aid. But if you have disease in the blood, you have to cure the blood. The underlying cause of all the pollution in the world is polluted consciousness. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells, I lost it. <laughs> Krishna is explaining from the, from the perspective of the divine that there are eight material elements. Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, and intelligence. And the ego. But beyond this, there is a superior energy, the jiva, the source of consciousness, which is actually the very foundational sustaining force of creation. Consciousness is the sustaining force of creation. The reason for the ecological pollution is very simple. The pollution of consciousness. Because our minds are highly polluted with toxic greed. And what is the nature of greed? It can never be satisfied. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, Prahlad Maharaj explains that if you're hungry, you eat some food, you're satisfied. If you're thirsty, you drink some liquid and you're satisfied. If you're angry, you let it out, or someone chastises you and you get the reaction to it, and basically your anger is subdued. But Prahlad says, but greed, even if you conquer, control, and become the proprietor of everything within the entire universe, your greed will never be satisfied. It's insatiable. 
It burns like fire. The more fuel you put in it, the hotter and higher it burns. The Vedic solution is to learn how to be content and satisfied with simple things. Due to ignorance, avidya, we're trying to find happiness in things, in stuff. But the soul is part of God. Mamaivam so jiva loke jiva bhuta sanatana. The soul, the heart, needs love. It's the only thing that can satisfy us, is to love and be loved. Even in a very worldly sense, if you have everything else, but you don't have someone to love, and you're not loved by people, there can be no real satisfaction. Because things cannot touch the heart. Sensual pleasures, mental pleasures do not touch the heart and satisfaction is not a thing of the mind, it's not a thing of the flesh, it's a thing of the heart. Our nature is to love God. And in loving God, we see every living being as part of God, we naturally love every living being. That brings contentment. Relationships bring satisfaction. But unfortunately, we become so obsessed with trying to find that satisfaction by accumulation and experiential interactions with things that we don't have healthy, satisfying relationships. We don't take responsibility for our relationships because they're not very important. We're preoccupied. Yes, and in these so-called developed countries, materially, we find massive divorce rates, massive mental depression. Why? They have things, but responsibilities, family values, relationships are compromised. And therefore their hearts are empty. Their bank accounts may be overflowing, but their hearts are empty. Their prestige and their fame may be skyrocketing. But without, without meaningful, deep, loving relationships, there's nothing there inside the heart. And there, bec bec to fill that emptiness, we become greedy. We become lusty. And when it's not fulfilled, we become angry. And if we get what we want, we become arrogant. And if we don't want, get what we want, we become envious and depressed. These are all just symptoms of a very sick, empty state of consciousness. And yet in today's world, the people who are the sickest, who are the most macho <laughs> into stepping on people's heads to get ahead, they're considered great heroes. But the Vedic solution is something very different. To find substantial satisfaction within. 
And that is called by our Gurudev Prabhupada's terminology, simple living and high thinking. We don't need unnecessary necessities. Whether you're living in a beautiful palace, or whether you're living in a straw hut, or whether you're living in a cave, if you're satisfied within, you'll be happy. But if you're not satisfied within, you're really going to be bored in that cave. <laughs> you're going to really be depressed about the straw hut. And as far as the palace, you're going to be in complete anxiety about everybody else who wants the palace and all the things that are going wrong in your palace and all the problems with the, with the mortgage for the palace. and everything going on inside. There can be no satisfaction. When little Vamanadev approached Bali Maharaj, he was a penniless little Brahmin dwarf, and he asked Bali, give me three steps of land. And Bali said, do you know who I am? <laughs> Actually, I'm putting the words in his, he didn't say exactly like that. I'm, He was speaking in Sanskrit. I'm putting it in common English language. He says, I'm, a, I, I'm the king. Why three steps of land? I'll give you houses. I'll give you property. I'll give you a planet. I'll give you everything you want. I have it. And essentially, Vamanadev said, what do you have? said, I have nothing, but because I have peace of mind, I'm happy. You have everything, but because you have peace of mind, you're miserable. And Bali Maharaj couldn't argue with that one. If you're not happy within yourself, you cannot be happy no matter what you get, no matter what you achieve. And if you're happy within yourself, you're happy no matter what you get or whatever, what you achieve. If you can't be satisfied with a little, you cannot be satisfied with a lot. That is an eternal principle. So Bhagavad Gita is not teaching poverty, but at the same time, it is teaching poverty. Poverty in a different way. We see Mahabharat, Srimad Bhagavat, so many scriptures. Most, many of the great saints we read about are kings and queens. They have royal wealth, but they're self-realized. They're perfect yogis because they, use, they don't consider their wealth to be their own. They consider everything to be the property of God. And they care for it and utilize it, not only for their own well-being, but for their families and for the world's well-being. They're not greedy. They're generous. They're kind. They're compassionate. So we find kings and we find sadhus who just sleep on the banks of rivers. They both have the same wealth within. Queen Kunti prays that one can feelingly chant God's name and access his mercy when akinjana gocharam. When one understands nothing is mine. Everything belongs to God. Bhaktaram jagatapasam sarva loka maheshwaram suhradam sarva bhutanam gyatvam am shanti mrichchati. Krishna says in Gita, if you want to be peaceful, it's very simple. The peace formula of the fifth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, just to accept 
that God, Krishna, is the proprietor of everything, is the controller of everything, and everything is ultimately for his satisfaction. Whether we're a king, whether we're an industrialist, or a doctor, or a teacher, or an author, or a student, or a housewife, or a farmer, or a sadhu. If you understand this principle, you could be peaceful in every single situation that comes upon you. But if you don't understand this principle, and you want to be the proprietor, you want to be the controller, and you want to be the enjoyer, it's not possible to be peaceful not for any duration, because it's an unnatural situation. It's not real. It's illusion. If you take a fish out of the sea and throw him in the sand, that fish, you can give him the most beautiful female fish to flap on the sand right next to each other, and they'll be flapping into each other. You could give that fish the best possible food, his favorite food, whatever it may be. You can give that fish a diamond necklace <laughs> from one of the best stores just down the street in Mumbai. In fact, there's a place that sells Mercedes-Benz. You can give them a Mercedes. <laughs> or what is that food they sell at Chopati Beach? Bell, bell. You can give them... <laughs> you could, could run across the sand and get them a whole plate of Bell Puris. <laughs> And he'll eat the bell puris and t -t 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 -t. he's thinking, now I'm so happy. But he's not happy. It's not real happiness until he goes back into the sea, which is his nature. So unless our consciousness returns to its original nature, we can't be, we're not satisfied. And the farther humanity goes away from the very essence of who they are, who we are, the more we become entangled and we use this magnificent, incredible, creative brain that God has given humans to realize the highest essence and to create a civilization in harmony with that essence, We start creating things, even in the name of good, sometime in the name of bad. We've created some really good bombs. Yes? Atomic bombs, hydrogen bombs, nuclear bombs. And they just keep getting better and better. And there are so many bombs in this world today, in so many countries. If America alone were to just release all their nuclear bombs, to speak of Russia, and China, and Pakistan, <laughs> and India, if everybody started releasing their bombs, Mumbai would go back to being Bombay. <laughs> Wouldn't matter who, which political party is ruling. <laughs> so, you know, we... The, 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 uh, the human intellect that takes to make those things. It's unbelievable. From the Vedic perspective, yoga means union. Yoga means 
harmony. The harmony between humans, between other species of life, between nature, and between God. That is yoga. Asanas, pranayam, yama, niyama, asana, pranayam, dharana, dhyan, samadhi, all of these different stages of yoga, they are all ultimately meant to bring our consciousness in harmony with nature, with other living beings, and with God. The earth is declared in the scriptures to be one of our seven mothers. Because like our mother, when we're infants in the womb, and when we just come out of the womb, we are totally dependent on our mother. Her compassion, her kindness, is our survival, yes? The embryo in the womb, if the mother wants to kill it, what is the, the embryo can't fight back. Totally dependent on the mercy of the mother. And when it comes out, totally dependent again. <laughs> 